Hey, what's up? It's Agostino here. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. As you know, hope you are well wherever this podcast is finding you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All things are good on my end. I switch things up this time around. Usually I'm live streaming my flipping podcast by thought today because I want to get through some, you know, meaty topics. I've got loads of stuff on the flipping docket to get through. I thought, you know what? Let me mix up a little bit and do a pre-recorded one and see how that sort of kind of goes. Going back to my roots of putting together stuff and then clipping it and then editing it and then condensing it and then getting rid of all the fluff and then uploading it. It's a bit long, but let's see let's see if the quality of the show is any different how am i all good off is considered i cannot lie um i've actually been thinking a lot about the idol since i passed since i last watched it and i think one thing that is for certain is that you know i wasn't really impressed with the show unfortunately especially being a big um, weekend fan and kind of loving his progression over the years and seeing how he's basically evolved as an artist from somebody that was incredibly shy about being in front of the cameras and now he can't stop flipping grinning for the cameras loves the flipping spotlight it's been amazing to see his transition from a somewhat underground artist into a legit pop star it's been great to see and i really want him to smash this flipping series out of the park but part of me watches the idol and thinks to myself they didn't really need to have two um non-actors to do the lead roles in this series they could have done with one non-actor and then another legit actor to play side by side to kind of bounce each other off because i feel like this show isn't really grounded in anything there's not really a strong enough performance to really hold your attention overall but one thing I noticed about Lily Rose Depp in the show is that she looks incredibly hot, right? She comes across really, really well on camera. And part of me thought to myself, you know what? Maybe we're doing people a disservice, especially young people, especially if they have the means and the ability to transform themselves, body, mind, spirit, whatever, and kind of do the whole looks maxing thing and make the best of what they have. Maybe one of the options, if you actually do want to be successful, in the entertainment industry specifically is to ensure that you're as good looking as you can make yourself because sometimes you look at people like lily rose depp and you think to yourself if you didn't look the way you did would you have any opportunities that you have in life regardless of her parents and stuff one half the parent obviously being johnny depp but regardless of that would you really think lily rose depp would be in the position that she is if she didn't look as good as she looks with clothes without clothes walking smiling whatever she looks I think sometimes, you know, the honest thing needs to be said to some people where if you have the ability to, if you have no real underlying health issues, you have the ability to work out, you've got good genetics, you've got a good base you can kind of work from, you're really doing yourself a disservice if you don't try to do the whole looks maxing thing where you make the best out of what you have available to see how far that can get you down the line. No one's saying you shouldn't work hard on your craft, but let's not deny that actually being somewhat attractive can really open some doors for you that probably talent alone can't and you know the whole notion that talent alone is going to get you through the door it's absolutely ridiculous i think the older you get the more you experience life the more you kind of see different things the more it kind of comes home you know it kind of should come home to you that it's a combination of things whether it's luck network talent um timing um you know opportunity all that sort of stuff kind of um has to kind of converge at one time for you to get the opportunity to do the things that you kind of want to do so i think a part of me watches that show and thinks to herself that may be the reason why lily rose Depp might have been the perfect cast for that show because in real life she's pretty i wouldn't say vapid but there's not much to her really that's of interest there's nothing really to kind of captivate an audience which is odd because i feel like Gigi Hadid has more to her but they're probably from the same sort of background in terms of upbringing in terms of privilege but there's something about Gigi Hadid maybe because of the way she looks and her posture and whatever it may be but whatever it is about Lily Rose Depp there's not much to her but then you also can't keep your eyes off her on the screen and then you're also made aware that hey maybe the whole reason why she got the role in the first place is because of what she looks like on camera but the performance itself is wow diabolical to say the least absolutely diabolical but hey what can you do you have to work with the flipping things that you're given and um i'll be legitimately shocked if that show gets a season two most likely it will because it involves such big you know um, entertainment figures and there's probably a whole lot of business attached to that show 
that has nothing to do with the show quality um like the weekends you know um new whatever monica is going to be going by going forward what the sound would be maybe lily rose depp launches her pop career off the back of it because she's got a song actually she dropped that's actually pretty tasty i'm not gonna lie that song is pretty good in terms of a pop song but again she's a package you know she's already got the package in terms of looks wise so if you've got some and she's got the means and you know the network to probably put together a pretty decent pop record so if you can hold a tune and if you can't we're gonna get flipping auto-tune to sort out your voice you could probably you know make yourself make a decent career for yourself we're already seeing what you know other sort of tiktok influencer people are already doing i think that addison ray girl is a good example she's meant to be doing a bit more singing and a bit more music sort of stuff but i think she's doing a lot of acting now but there was a time in period where she was kind of trying to pursue the whole pop star thing and that was mostly to do with hey i look good already on camera people are already looking at me i've already got their attention so why don't we just ramp it up a little bit and add another kind of string to my bow or just add a string to my bow even though you know another one you don't even have one that might be a good way to go about it but hey what can you do with pretty people what can you do with pretty people on the completely opposite side of things this is nothing to do with pretty people at all there's this article that i just saw on TechCrunch that really surprised me um because if anything this says more about the flipping you know how regular people are being outpriced in terms of living in major cities around the world because this headline is absolutely wild it is courtesy of TechCrunch. it says nobody is happy with new york city's 18 dollar delivery worker minimum wage so new york is introducing an 18 dollar um per hour minimum wage for people that do the whole gig economy thing working for uber east Deliveroo, doordash whatever else you have out there and allegedly $18 per hour isn't enough. Even if they're doing like reg other gigs of so most people that I know that do this kind of delivery stuff, because I was looking at doing it myself, they basically um work with different apps at the same time. So you kind of app switch. So essentially you could kind of double dip and be able to make, you know, um, you know, a lot of money if basically depending on how much battery you got, you know, how fit you are on a bike and whatnot, you could kind of make a lot of money in a day. But supposedly $18 is not enough per hour. That really says a lot about the current state of the economy um, right now that you're in a place where you can't afford to kind of live day to day on $18 per hour. That's madness. It continues here. The article says, New York City has established a new minimum wage for delivery workers who deliver on platforms such as Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub and Relay. It should be a historic win for gig workers, but both delivery and companies are unhappy with it. Many workers, labor rights activists, and even the city's con um, comptroller say the minimum pay just under $18 per hour is not nearly enough to cover the cost of living in New York City or the cost of being a delivery driver. App-based gig economy companies say the ruling will cause unintended consequences for workers, and a spokesperson for DoorDash told TechCrunch that legislation isn't off the table. Don't get me wrong. Last time I went to New York was a very long time ago. I think it might have been like 2009 or 10 or something. But one thing I remember quite clearly is that there was a big gap, I remember, in terms of like, you know, regular slash pizza shops and then like restaurants. The gap was really stark, like in terms of like price. I remember we went to this one place. I think it was like a bar. It was like a bar where you basically get with every pint you order, you get like a mini pizza. You can order a thing for a pound or something, or maybe it was free. I forgot what the notion was it, but it was like a seven inch piece that they did in the back and you got it with a beer. And then if you wanted extra toppings, you'd have to pay like a dollar on top and whatnot. And um, that place was booming. It was full of students, full of, you know, ratty guy, the kids like us hipsters and stuff hanging in there, trying to get the most out of our money. We'd be eating there. We'd be eating in a couple of burger shops and slash shops. But I remember just those places were really cheap. They were like, you know, anywhere between like $5 to $20 for a good meal. But if you went to a restaurant, it suddenly jumped up to like $50, $60 per head. I was like, damn, man, why didn't have anything in the middle? So I can only imagine how weird it must be now with, you know, with the whole delivery apps, um, platforms kind of booming over there and stuff and restaurants kind of springing up all over the place because i think the only place probably has more restaurants per square mile than flipping london probably might be new york it continues it says of course there are those who say that the perfect um shouldn't be the enemy of the god um or, sorry enemy of the good 
and plenty of delivery workers are in support of the ruling. New York City's delivery workers currently make $7.09 an hour on average, according to the release of the city. So the new ruling is certainly a step up, but it's clear that the continuous issue will further divide two camps. Companies that use delivery workers will get to choose between one or two minimum pay rates options outlined by the city. The first option requires the companies to pay a worker at least seventeen ninety six per hour, excluding tips for uh, for time spent connected to the app. While this includes um, time spent waiting for a gig, this will increase with inflation next year to about nineteen dollars ninety six per hour. The other option involves the apps paying zero point well fifty cents basically per minute on the active time, exclusive of trips. Um, active time happens from the moment the worker accepts the delivery to the moment they drop off the food. While none of the gig companies specified um, which method of payment they might follow, industry experts have their money on the zero fifty cents, of course, active option, minute per active already, sorry, paying per active minimum is already written into those companies. That depends, of course, because the 50 cent per active minute is essentially a zero hour contract. So they'd much rather give you a zero hour contract than pay you hourly because if you get paid hourly you could still get paid a decent amount even if you do a less amount of deliveries but if you get paid but you know 50 cents per the minute you have to basically do a lot more deliveries to get more money out of it there's more earning potential but you have to kind of do a lot more drops so obviously it kind of puts the strain on the delivery driver it continues that in California, where Proposition 22 is the law of the land, companies are guaranteed to pay at least 120% of the local minimum wage for active miles. If the minimum wage is $14, $14 per hour at delivery that took 15 minutes door to door, would earn the worker for 20 Too little, too late. Many deliveries deliveristas the company of the app-based delivery workers and labor right activists argue the city is about six months late in ruling of delivery worker minimum pay rate and that the revised set of rules is a reduction for the initially proposed um, pay formula in november the city had proposed a minimum pay of 24 dollars per hour the 18 dollar pay rate will end up looking more like around 13 dollars per hour after expenses according to a statement in september 2021 department of consumers and workers um set a deadline for the minimum pay rate for deliveries there's in public comments many geek workers said they should be back paid for the first half of the year so pretty crazy to think like i said the cost of living in new york is that high that 18 dollars per hour isn't enough but I think probably the same thing happens in London, really. I just know how to kind of manoeuvre. I'm pretty sure some people out there can't survive on flipping £20 per month, per hour, sorry, um, based on where they live, based on their flipping spending habits and shit. It can get really pricey, especially here in London. We have a you know a saying, basically, once you step out of your house here, you're spending already 100 quid, especially if you're on a night out somewhere. Um, it can get really expensive really quickly. So I do understand that, but it's just a bit bleak to kind of see that be the case. So um, solidarity to all my delivery drivers drivers out there in new york hold your head up high and i hope you get it sorted next i want to quickly mention and go back to the documentary i previously mentioned in the previous episode of the podcast called a non-stop party the dark side of ibiza currently available on the vice channel on youtube part of the high society series that got going on this section at the beginning was the one that really kind of hit home to me and kind of resonated with me the most because I remember kind of, you know, having similar sessions with friends and by myself and whatever it may be of this kind of ilk when you're a bit younger and you feel like you're kind of, you know, you're on flipping, you feel like you're in on the set of fucking Project X. It feels absolutely amazing. You're absolutely loving life. And there was a time in my life where I was legitimately fantasizing about moving to Berlin, moving to whatever these party cities are around the world and essentially just chasing the dragon every single day then you get more experience going out you go to these places yourself on holiday and you feel like you know what as much as i enjoy these things that i'm going to i also like the peace and serenity of coming back to a fairly quiet area of london and just basically do my own thing away from the hustle and bustle of the nightlife scene it's kind of nice to kind of dip my toes in it and then kind of go back so the idea of me kind of being on a never-ending sesh is horrifying but it was something that i legitimately was kind of angling for when i was a bit younger especially i was a bit more of a novice in the scene but seeing this clip of these two seasonal workers who are in ibiza doing their thing but they've also been consumed by the drugs and the scene that kind of, you know, is out there. It's kind of sad because you go out there with the best intentions. You go out there to kind of network, maybe to make a name for yourself, to just experience what it must be like on the other side of the road. Because I feel like we all have that 
um, in us when we go to our first sort of club nights and parties. Some of us decide to just be lifelong fans where we just kind of, you know, pop in here and there to a special event. Some of us go to a party and the first thing that kind of happens is that you get inspired and you start thinking, oh, I should maybe make some music. Maybe I should maybe open my own club. Maybe I should set up my own label. Maybe I should start DJing. Maybe I should start designing flyers, doing merch, whatever, do, being the door guy, door girl. Like everybody has these kind of ideas when they go to these sort of things. Um, but a lot of it has to do with just being involved. You just want to be a part of the community. So when I see these guys alone in their room together, just getting absolutely, you know, yacked out of their flipping brains and then going to work later and then probably doing the same thing after they finish an after party somewhere in another room it just kind of feels a little bit sad to be completely honest and um it kind of was a, a wake-up call for me and also a realization that i'm definitely not on that level anymore i was in the past but for now it definitely isn't something that kind of resonates or kind of fills me with anything like i don't feel like fomo i don't feel like i want to be there like it's just like you know you're just watching it as legitimately like an animal you know animal planet documentary just kind of going oh ah oh, why would you do that why would you do this why would you do that kind of thing it's kind of mad but i'll play the clip for you now it's courtesy of the vice channel um like i said to you for the title is non stop party dark side of our beef first of clip towards the beginning of it and you hear these two seasonal workers speak about their experience on there I've been invited to a couple of season worker turned drug dealer pre-drinks as they get ready for a big night out at a super club. Tell us what's on the table. Good I mean, there's a weed pork. Quite the concoction. And you're both season workers, right? Mm -hmm. We promote events after parties. What's it like to be on the last week of the season? Doing a documentary with Vice, sitting down with them and just like sniffing, <laughs> doing little bumps of fucking cat weed or whatever they're doing. It's absolutely wild. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, the masks are pretty cool. They've got these little cat masks on with little LED lights around them. But God almighty, it's kind of bleak, man. They're sitting in this kind of hostel room or something where they are like, yeah, 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 yeah. And the bubble is going to explode. If you come here and live in Ibiza or for a vacation, as the first time, uh, you will be in the bubble of Ibiza. Ibiza. You can party everywhere in the world, but here there's a vibe, there is something you can, you can I love, I can feel, you can touch. Has it not taken its toll at all? No. Me, I'm, I'm still awake from yesterday. Wow. Had to take it as time. Has taken his toll. No, and I can even see from the way he's moving. He's got the kind of you don't if you can't see the video, but he's sort of moving in that sort of jittery kind of Mediterranean kind of way that they do when they get a bit yacked. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of like Ricardo Villa Lobos behind the deck, so that kind of like you know constantly flipping fidgety sort of vibe where if you do enough flipping drugs, your brain just get, gets fried, and you've always got the kind of look that you're kind of on it when you're not. <laughs> That's kind of how they look. Really, I went party after party after after party, and now I'm party again. Yes, I yes, I yes, party, party, party. So you're a dealer as well? Uh, yeah. Do you do a lot of your drugs? Do you end up taking them? One night, I got uh, around 10 pills to take them in the club. You know, someone asked me, but... Uh, you ate them all? All. 10? To be honest with you, it's not 10. Some crazy. 12 or 14. Imagine having 12 to 14 pills on your own. Usually for the most part, I when I was raving proper, proper hard, I would prefer taking pills than MDMA because, I don't know, I hate the gurning. Um, with your jaw swinging over the place you just look super unattractive and it's a not you know not the chicest thing to do but a pill you could easily kind of just break it up into little bits and have it with your drink and stuff and whatnot it could be quite cool i know some people like to put mdma in their water but i don't really like the taste of it i want to drink water when i want to drink water and i want to drink beer when i want to drink beer i don't want to have like fucking you know mdma water flipping taste in it so i prefer to take the pill but usually it kind of has a ceiling you just kind of hit a wall after a moment. You don't keep chasing it, really. You don't really want that. Your brain kind of gets fried, serotonin levels, all that malarkey. You don't really want that. So you can only imagine the levels you have to be on to ingest 12 pills for yourself, especially ones you're going to sell. Because I'd imagine pills that are pretty lucrative to sell, especially out in the club. Like you could probably get away with maybe selling one for 10 euros, 20 euros and shit. That's a lot of money in your pocket. So you're also in the back of your head knowing that when you're taking them out, you're like, cool, I could eat these all. But if I sell a couple, that could pay for my night out. That's obviously quite appealing to kind of just chill out. But for these guys, it wasn't. He just took them straight to the face. 
something like this. But, uh, we always take something from the stuff we sell. So like we are not paying for them, so... It makes everything cheaper. Yeah. So what are your plans for tonight then? Tonight it's a clothing party, so... Uh, it's gonna be crazy. Yeah, like I said, it's funny because there was a time in my life where all I wanted to do was be in those rooms, especially when you go to like parties and after parties. Sometimes, you know, the cool kids go into a certain room. You don't, you know, I'm never one to kind of beg it. Um, part of my, you know, weird kind of approach to nightlife has always been to kind of be the best sort of person you bump into on a dance floor. I've always wanted to be that kind of person where you kind of share a story about, oh, I met this guy. He was really cool. We had a good vibe. We danced. Everything was fun. Nothing was creepy. Everything was cool. Bless. Good laughs. I kind of want to always want to be that person. So whenever I went to an after party or an afters, as they call it here, um, I never wanted to be the person that was the last one there. It happens sometimes because you just I just keep talking and shit and I kind of lose track of time, but I never wanted to be the last one there. And I always wanted to kind of be the perfect guest you know um and just kind of be a good vibe and a good person to be around and sometimes even doing all that doesn't allow you to go in certain rooms some people don't want to call you because i don't know some people get high and stuff they want to be a bit you know with their own friends they don't want to be around strangers i understand but you know at the peak of my time one of the goals was to get in those rooms you're looking forward to oh my god man maybe this will work out you might see some people that you saw another time you might kind of do a bit of a head nod you recognize each other and work up that connection it's just a weird world to live in like you're kind of living in this world where it's somehow cool and looked at as somewhat of a status symbol that you get fucked up and you're out all the time. Like you see a lot on some, you know, especially on the Bergheim forums, like people talking about, or the Bergheim subreddit, people talking about, you know, being a regular at Bergheim, which is essentially you admitting that you go there like every single weekend. And it's part of the kind of, you know, you wear it like a kind of badge of honor. To, you're there every weekend, people recognize you and stuff, which is one thing, but then indulging in all the flipping vices and all the flipping adult activities that take part in it, it's probably a little bit too much, I'd imagine. Um, I'm sure there are people out there that exist that do go to kind of, you know, IB for nights out, you know, Berlin nights out, and just go to listen to the music, they just go to explore, go hear some new sounds, connect with a new community every weekend, just just for the fun of it because like i said as, as an adult as i said previously before it's really difficult to find hobbies that you really enjoy so when you do find something even as destructive as clubbing sometimes it can be hard to let go of it but you can make it somewhat you know manageable by just having it be something that you do with friends to go out to make new friends to listen to new music just to people watch all that shit can be quite cool but like i said i just can't you know it's hard to kind of picture Agostino from before wanting to be in this room and wanting to be a part of this kind of little session stuff and then continuing it on at another place another place another place now the you know the one thing that I'm doing is fucking berating flipping club nights and messaging them on Instagram stories to give me the fucking set list um so I know who's playing when so I know when to come and stuff like I'm complaining about the flipping you know the heating the air conditioning in clubs because I'm a lot more present than I was before I'm not just getting out there to get fucking geeked I'm out there to kind of listen to the music to vibe to fucking record you know voice memos on my phone and then try and shazam it later on it's a whole completely different vibe out there but um like i said it's just a bit you know a little bit of a bummer to see these guys doing what they're doing but i could also imagine in their head they're probably thinking they're having an absolute whale of a time and they don't see anything wrong with it in the slightest but for me i saw this i was like you know what this is kind of depressing and i'm kind of happy that i'm not in that same sort of vibe or spirit anymore but like i said check out the documentary yourself in full it's really really good i really recommend it it's called a non-stop party the dark side of of ibifa full film available on vice check it out it's fucking amazing really good insight into what you know ib is like like the dark side and kind of it should give you if you're a person that gets on it it should give you some you know clarity as to where you are where you stand do you identify the people on there are you a little bit far removed whatever it may be you'll definitely see yourself in one of the people that's featured on there for sure okay so moving on from that one i went to mention this this is some really good news courtesy of ra really 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 good news it says here london listening bar jumbi granted a 2 a.m license the decision was made last monday by Suffolk council um as you guys know london my home city is not the greatest when it comes to you know permitting certain clubs and venues for having late licenses there's something really strange about councils and local boroughs and 
flipping what you call it sorry local residents and stuff in terms of nightlife establishments people just don't like the anti-social behavior attached with it the noise whatever maybe the flipping you know the rubbish what who knows what the deal is but there's always been a really fraught relationship between clubs and the community around them and people that live there it just doesn't really usually work out which means most of our little club scenes or the best clubs don't last that long um you have to kind of enjoy them while they're around and then you know you come back a couple of years later and then suddenly they're not allowed to open after 10 p.m which basically kills their business or they lose their license and stuff and then suddenly the club isn't functioning as it once were and then eventually shuts down and turns into an all-white photo studio or some shit same old nonsense so it's good to hear that this place has got a license and this is a really good one because this is a listening bar as well um um, that I have always wanted to actually check out since it opened. But um, let's read the article regardless. It says here, South London Hi-Fi Bar and Restaurant Jumbi has been granted a permanent 2 a.m. license by Southwark Council. The effective immediately, the decision was handed down in person at Southwark Council in London Bridge last Monday, June 12th. The venue's owners, Bradley Zero Philip and Nathaniel Williams, set either side of the lawyer, Matthew Buck KC. Thanks to the thousands of you who have petitioned the council and our legal team staff and councils of Southwark for recognising what we do and what it brings up beloved Peckham. These two extra hours may seem like may not seem like much, but they make all the difference. Safeguarding our future in the area and allowing us freedom to experiment, push things forward and give more back. Jumbi will host its first extended event this Friday on the 14th with music by Ben Gormi and Laura Shelley. Browse the venue's Instagram for up and coming listings. Um, founded last summer, Peckham venue is centred around Roger Ellis and Tanoi sound system and a single turntable with a focus on deeps listening a selection of a mixing there's also a large library of records from Bradley Zero's personal collection which guest DJs are invited to use so it's a really good kind of platform listening bar we've had a few of those here in, in London some of them have worked some of them haven't I'm actually surprised that listening bars don't work by and large here in London because we have more of a restaurant cocktail bar culture here and um, people don't tend to kind of permit clubs are open late but there's no shortage of fucking restaurants and cocktail bars so why not kind of have you know listening bars which is kind of an extension of those sort of things because most listening bars have like you know little nibbles you can order and whatnot as you're seated so i've always been surprised why listening bars don't work in that regard because most trendy restaurants you go to they're always playing some super loud fucking crappy nts set through the fucking speakers why not actually have somebody there selecting and actually putting on some fucking amazing crazy records and actually having a little bit of range and mixing things up and not just being fucking techno on a weekend at 7 p.m maybe some classical music some jazz here and there to kind of get things you know in the right mood and whatnot or just be a good place to kind of pre-game before you go to another club and that's the only bad thing about london spaces like really and truly this jumbi space should be a place where you can go to to pre-game before you head over to fucking phonox or something but sometimes i'd imagine places like fun especially in london they won't even let you in after maybe 2 a.m or maybe after three so you go there you have a good time you're chatting away outside having a cigarette with the owners or maybe some people that you've met in there you go over to flipping fun or ray for a couple of more hours and you go there and say no entry after a certain time it's like what so it kind of limits your time available but those extra two hours will definitely help them be able to be open at 2 a.m um definitely makes things a little bit more flexible and obviously would attract a different type of clientele because i'm definitely going to check it out now they're being open at two flipping um 2 a.m for sure but the whole premise behind it as it being a listening bar type of thing that you can kind of sit down in and kind of chill um with a great sound system and a great vibe is something that i'm definitely eager to go and check out for sure from the stuff that i've seen the pictures i've seen available it looks absolutely crazy they've got is that kerry chandler was he playing there recently Raw Ted. Okay, cool. I oh, know I guess this was maybe somewhere else. But I guess they're posting other things on there. But it looks absolutely great. I really want to check this venue out and see what the vibe is saying there. Jumbi over there and flipping Peckham. See what the flipping vibe is like. Some deep listening, some chilling out. The good thing I like about South, similar to how we have it in East, it's a whole different world in itself. It's not, you know, they kind of exist in their own little bubble over there. They do their own little thing. They've got their own little clubs, um, record stores and whatnot. It's nothing to do with us over here in East whatsoever. Um, I'm not really too sure what the, what they would deem to be their version of like a fold, maybe venue MOT. I'm not too sure, but they've got loads of venues that are open kind of late. Um, the only bad thing about South is like it's all really spread out. 
Um, so if you're in one area of South, it's kind of hard to get to the other bit, um, especially if you're cycling because the fucking hills over there are brutal. I remember going there once on a fixed sea and nearly dying <laughs> from the hills I had to go up and down in, but the space itself looks absolutely beautiful. Per cuts of the pictures I've seen here available. They've even got like a little outside terrace bit now. Um, some good options of food here. It looks like it's Caribbean food available there. Um, mix, maybe a Caribbean mix, maybe a Mexican, I'm not too sure, but there's plantain. I see some little taco-y, rapi type of things going on there. But yeah, the food looks absolutely banging. The space looks really great. Loads of records, nice warm type of feel, great cocktails, nice lounge chairs to sit in and get lost in the vibe and whatnot. So definitely a place that I'm definitely going eager to see what the vibe is and to kind of check it out. And like I said, with the, you know, with that flipping license extension, it gives people like me an excuse to go and check it out and see what the vibe is saying. So definitely going to see that. So congratulations to Jumbi. More power to Jumbi. More power to Jumbi. Next, we've got this news, which is kind of sad, courtesy of RA. It says inaugural Black Music Summit postponed due to financial constraints. This is a really bad look. I'm hoping it's just you know, operational costs were high or just high as opposed to the interest wasn't great and then they had to scrap it because these sort of things are meant to be um, things that can kind of essentially help to kind of rewrite the conversation around kind of highlighting and pushing up, you know, underrepresented voices, especially in dance music, electronic music, and kind of pushing them forward. So if summits like this get cancelled because of financial constraints, it kind of looks wild because it's hard to justify the inclusion of unrepresented people if we're not able to kind of fulfill, you know, summits and stuff and get those kind of cracking and get those going because it looks like the demand isn't really there really, which is, I don't think, the case, to be honest. I think the demand is there. Um, personally, that's what I would say. But let's read the article it says the first edition of the black music summit in ibiza has been postponed the team broke the news on instagram today on june 14th they said the show might be paused but the mission remains and we hope to be able to create something more um, change in the future billed as the first industry summit celebrating black music and professionals the event was due to take place in september so it's some far away and they're already cancelling it it's not good um a soft launch featuring the likes of Seth Troxler and Jules took place at the White Owl Clubs in Pikes and High last year. Read the Music Summit post in full down below. So that's the post there. They got, um, while the situation is extremely frustrating and a true loss of the community, we hope that we are able to continue the mission and helping to create a better industry for black people. And we'll take some time to take stock and reassess how we can carry out our values. If you have any questions or would like to more information, let us know it's kind of yeah kind of a bit sad that regard but i hope this doesn't dissuade them from not pursuing this further and continuing it um like i said i would you know love to get involved in something like this if it means just pushing it out and promoting it on my platform then i will but i hope that you are able to kind of gather tools and get back on it again and be able to push that forward that is my hope that is my hope next we have this news courtesy of ra again regarding a really interesting club night taking place at Colour Factory. Courtesy of RA, it says as follows. Mina to host an alcohol-free party at London's Colour Factory. An alcohol-free party. Really good idea. On a Sunday as well, so big up Mina. So Mina is launching a new alcohol-free um, party in East London's Colour Factory. Taking place on Sunday, the April 18th. Club Soft is geared towards anyone who loves electronic music but struggles for late nights or drinking culture. Um, I don't have any judgment towards those that drink, she continued, but alcohol-centered spaces are a default in the club music and alcohol just just doesn't work for a lot of people so i wanted to create an alternative space running from 4 p.m to 10 p.m an amazing time to be honest especially on a sunday especially with the sun out and shit um the first club soft no i, was, not april, I guess it's june the person got it wrong it's not april, it's not april 18th it's gonna be june 18th i'm assuming um the first club soft will feature the sets on mina um fire dread ilau and blue edmonds delish and manor will also go back to back check out the twitter thread below and she said i stopped drinking six years ago due to health reasons and since then it's been a dream of mine to create an alcohol free party so excited that club stuff is happening this sunday 18th of june color factory and the weather looks perfect yeah so this is a great time to do something like this i also think there's definitely more of an appetite as you can see here already 47 people already going and it's a it feels like a last minute thing they announced so it's definitely a interest in it is high 
But I feel like nowadays, especially with club culture being the way it is in London and kind of blowing up in several ways and there being different sort of communities of people that go out nowadays, I'm sure there are there is a good enough contingent out there to make a night like Mina, um, what well, to make a night like Club Soft work and to make it kind of somewhat sustainable um, to kind of continue on going forward. Because that would be a good thing to have because you'd imagine most nightclubs between the hours of like 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. on a Sunday don't really have anything going on anyway. And this is like a continuation of a party from Saturday. So why not give a club night like this an opportunity to try something um, and offer something different to the punters out there? I actually do really, really like the idea. Um, personally. I think that really works really great. And there's opportunity for people to kind of do great things. And maybe it actually might give an opportunity for DJs also that want to play more gigs where they're not surrounded by flipping fucked up people all the time. That could also be an option. And there might be some gigs, some DJs out there who, you know, don't feel comfortable playing too often in different places because they feel like it can maybe tempt them to do things that they swore they wouldn't do. So maybe having the ability to play in these sort of spaces is something that would maybe resonate with them more. Who knows? But I really like the idea. Big up Mina, Club Soft, this Sunday, 18th of June over there at the Color Factory. You can see the details there available on RA. Check it out if you need. Check it out if you need. Moving on from that one, I want to mention some things that I'm kind of looking forward to checking out this weekend that I want to go to party-wise. That's there. There's so much on this weekend. It's going to be hard to kind of figure out which ones I should be going to and whatnot. Number one, number one night that I probably will end up going to because the lineup is just too good is this courtesy of Tech Couture at Fold. Um, they do some of the better parties there at Fold. There's a few promoters there that absolutely smash it over there. Um, that you know, uh, I feel like have a really Really interesting booking policy um and they just put on good parties there's a good community of people that go out there and i'm just imagining actually on friday it's going to be absolutely boiling and fucking fold in there jesus christ anyway we might have to make it work so tech culture this friday 16th of june at fold featuring steffi the absolute legend renee why somebody that i've only just discovered a couple of years ago but somebody that's absolutely killing it i've seen him play in burger i've seen him play here in london and absolutely i'm in love with the kid he's absolutely amazing and leah oche Leah Uche, I'm not really familiar to. If I just click her name, let's just see who this person is. Is that the person I used to see when I used to go out a lot? Um, let's see, dark-haired girl. Is that the person I used to know? No, it's not. I don't know this person. But <laughs> regardless, um, Leah Uche is playing there as well. So I'm definitely interested to see that and what that vibe is saying. Available at Fold. So I think it's about 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., I'm sure, in terms of timing. Or 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., actually. Um, there's some tickets available. A lot of them have sold out, actually. I think it's only general release are available now. First, second release are all sold out. And now only general admissions available for £23 plus booking free. So definitely check that out. And let's in the venue. You've got Bessie May and DJ O playing there um the flipping description says Tech Ultra returns this Gemini season with the mother of all lineups joining us at Fold. We have Steffi alongside her with powerhouse producer and selector Renee Wise, as well as unbelievable talented co-founder and resident of Spectrum Waves, Leah Uchi. This will also this one will be absolutely outrageous. So if you're planning on joining us, do not delay. Advanced tickets available, blah 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 blah. So definitely check that out if you're interested. I think that'll be a good night. Another one there that I'm also just to check out would be Dimitri from Paris playing at Coco. Absolute legend in, in terms of disco music and still, you know, one of the best remixes out there. So that'd be a, definitely a good one to check out over that Coco. And Coco venue is really interesting because essentially it's a converted theater that's now turned into a late night nightclub sort of venue with good sound system and whatnot. So it's a different sort of space than what you're used to in terms of the regular kind of box room of a club so that'll be a good option and then another one is the one that i actually have tickets for already is e1 presents freddie k kaiser dj gigola organzo and mcrt this is like a full stack lineup of like the berlin's you know um favorites and shit which is quite cool i've seen e1 do that quite a lot i'm not too sure if they've got some I, i'd imagine they've got somebody who books the nights who's just plugged in and knows wagwan because i feel like whenever there's somebody in berlin who's popping up and kind of making a name for themselves they jump on them super quick and get them playing over here in E1 which is absolutely amazing because it gets an opportunity to them to play in front of I think like you know a really 
receptive crowd, similar to playing in a uh, fold or whatever, because a lot of people that go to E1 are European, you know, Italian, Spanish, French, whatever, German. So you get an opportunity to kind of play in front of that kind of crowd, especially if you've come from a place like Berlin, you're definitely going to find a new kind of fan base over there and be able to kind of gauge, you know, your popularity or lack thereof and build from it. So I always feel like they do a really good job of it. So this is a, also a great one. Freddie K, we already know well, go to him and he's legendary closing sets over there at Berkheim and shit. I've seen him play a few times here in London, seen him play once already in Bergheim, so it'd be great to see him again. Kai's I've never seen, Organza I've never seen play before, DJ Gagola I've never seen play, MCRT I've never seen play, even though I'm familiar with him, um, Kirsch of his sets over there at Hoare, so I'm really curious to see what that's going to be like. And another person called Alcatraz, who I'm not really too familiar with, but both rooms for me are great. Um, love the space, uh, great cloakroom, easy to use, decent smoke. Smoking area is actually pretty not good, to be fair. It's always kind of good bants to be had with randoms that you meet over there in the flipping smoking area um the only thing that's a bit of a madness in e1 is the fucking drinks prices they're absolutely insane but it is what it is so definitely eager to check out those events going forward um loads are there to kind of pick from if you're that interested to kind of go to these kind of club nights you see them all there all my options that are kind of selected there already you've got the tech culture over there at fold um, you've got Dimitri, Dimitri from Paris, sorry, at Coco. And then you've got, lastly, E1 Presents, Freddie K, Kaiser, DJ Gigola, Organzo, and MCRT over there at E1. So definitely check those out if you are interested. So moving on from that, let's talk about this. Um, this is courtesy of Hypebeast regarding Supreme. And it says Supreme reports decreased value of revenue in financial year ending March 2023. It says in the fiscal year ending March 2023, Supreme reported revenues of 523 million, marking a free 38 million decrease from the same figure of the same year period, according to parent company VF Corp's report. The streetwear label's revenue results fell short of the VF Corp's 600 million US target by a significant margin. Additionally, Supreme's net income took a hit, tallying 64 million down from last year's 82 million. VF Corp, which runs its own brands, including Dickies, um, North Face, Vant, and Timberland, acquired Supreme in a 2.1 billion US deal. And the 2020 the brand sale led many fans to question whether supreme would still be able to maintain its place in streetwear in february of last year the imprint appointed them tears tremaine emery's creative director and the goal of bolstering its roots throughout the progressive look notably supreme's brand utilizes a different business model than the rest of real course facing unique risks due to its own focus on frequent weekly limited edition drops across its direct consumer channel according to the report vs failure to make the necessary adaptations to its operations to address these characteristics complexities and market dynamics could have a effect of vf's revenue business addition conditions sorry and results of operations while supreme's declining revenue could re result in a unique business model it also has been indicative of the fashion's uh rapidly shifting trend cycle that has expanded many luxury focus outside of streetwear in recent years so what's my opinion on this I'm not surprised, but I also don't think it's as doom and gloom as people making it as. I know people like Bobby, you know, Bobby Hundreds was kind of, I felt like he was, he made the post that kind of felt like, you know, he wasn't really saying anything, but kind of saying something where I felt like he was sort of like dancing on their grave um, a little bit with Supreme kind of like saying, hey, you know, finally, you know, real life is sort of caught up with them because, you know, maybe the hundreds have been facing, you know, the challenges of an ever-changing economy and world, whereas Supreme kind of existed in a bubble for a very long time where just things just kept working out for them year on year. But now maybe with the investment and, uh, you know, with, with, yeah, with the investment and the targets being what they are, they've now kind of semi-fallen short. But I don't think it's that big of a deal because I think in general, Supreme has way more product than they did many years ago when I started purchasing it. They have way more stores, way more flipping you know units probably get made per item um the skus are probably increased across the board so it's no surprise that the targets aren't being hit because there's just way too much stuff out there that they're selling and pushing every single season and it's just not enough kids out there to kind of make those targets make sense in the general scheme of things especially when you consider you know the cycle of brands and the fact that a lot of the i feel like a lot of the streetwear consumer base are kind of spread across different sort of scenes and labels and whatnot. It's not all just kind of concentrated with the big hitters 
there are some kids out there that just specifically only buy from particular kind of instagram based streetwear brands there are some that kind of stick to the heritage stuff it's all kind of spread out all over the place i think because of that the brand loyalty that kind of used to exist before when i was buying shit doesn't exist nowadays kids just mix and match they do different things they wear different things they get their stuff from different places some kids specifically only buy their stuff secondhand from depop and other sort of places like ebay and whatnot so all that stuff is definitely going to affect um spots like supreme and what they're doing in terms of records going forward what i still think is admirable about supreme all these years on is the fact that they're still the kind of i feel like one of the kind of trend leaders they're still one of the kind of people who sets the tone they're still one of the brands that essentially has their finger on the pulse they have a really uncanny ability to be able to kind of handpick people who are going to continue that beat they never seem like they're trying too much never seem like they're trying too hard never seem like they're off pace they always seem like they're kind of on point and the good example for me is always kind of be the skate team you look at the skate team and how that's evolved over the years and who's involved and who kind of reps it and it's always kind of changing but it's always got their finger on the pulse of kind of who's next and who's coming up and who's going to represent the brand the best so i think they do a really good job of that going forward so i don't think this is going to really impact them the long way the only thing that's concerning about the report having read it is that it kind of sounds like vf corp did what most companies do when they buy you know brands and stuff or buy companies big corporations right uh sorry big corporations big funds whatever they may be they buy companies and they usually let you do what you want in the hope that you're going to reach the targets then if you don't reach the targets, they come in and start fiddling around with shit, start reorganizing stuff, maybe start, you know, having a bit more say in certain things, giving notes. So that's the only thing that's a bit concerning from what I can read in that, you know, brief summary from Hypebeast. It sounds like they might now start thinking, OK, you didn't hit the targets doing it the way you want to do things. Now we're going to do it the way we do things with all our brands that we kind of own and see how that kind of goes. That might be the only thing. And then also that might then end up spelling the end of some people's careers who've been working there for a while because you know some people are going to be in stepping on your toes you're going to be micromanaged and whatnot you're going to have different people to report to all those things could really negatively negatively affect people's um you know sense of work whatever else they do when they go to those kind of places there's anything that's a little bit concerning if you're working on the inside but as a consumer as a customer um i'm so happy with what they do i still think they do great work and i'm definitely still buying fucking supreme even to this day i buy a lot of stuff still from the online store i buy a lot of stuff on depop i buy a lot of stuff on flipping ebay on vinted nowadays as well all those kind of platforms um because i feel like a lot of the stuff that i kind of get for the most part especially after the fact um is usually the the better product is less flashy and shit and it's stuff that i would definitely can wear with loads of different outfits and it feels like it can kind of grow with me as i kind of progress in the scene and whatnot so yeah i'm definitely on it so big up supreme long may they rain long may they rain next we're going to talk about martin rose spring 2024 menswear in a bit more detail than i did before in the last show um i'm really impressed by it legitimately and i have to say i'm really happy and impressed by it because I'm really glad that Martin Rose never ended up taking a job at a big luxury house. I'm sure it was offered. Like my kind of, you know, um, hunch would be that either she was offered a role and rejected it or she got overlooked for a role and then decided, you know what, I don't really care anymore now. But regardless, I'm happy that Martin Rose has the ability now to just do her own thing with the brand that she has now and also do other collaborations and also do this new gig that she already has now with Flipping Clarks, actually. Let's actually check that, actually, before we go to the collection. I actually want to see what that news is with Clarks. I remember seeing it here on Hypebeast. They featured a little post regarding Martin Rose's new role there at Clark's. And I want to see what the shoes look like because I'm really curious to see what she's done because I feel like Martin Rose has a really interesting perspective on footwear design. So I'm curious to see how she approached the whole Clark's role as a guest um, creative director. So this is the first post here. Martin Rose previews an up and coming collection with um, Clark's. Let's see what the shoes here say, courtesy of Hypebeast. I want to see what they look like. It kind of looks like from first accounts, like a classic Dr. Martin type of boot. Oh, wow, look at that. It's a completely different silhouette. I've never seen that silhouette from Flipping Clarks. It basically looks like a high heel loafer type of shoe. Um, completely different than what you've used to seeing from Clarks. And then they've got like what looks like a Dr. Martin-esque type of shoe. From what I can see here, there's one that looks like a wingtip on the left-hand side in the leather. And there's one here that looks like a... I don't know how to describe it. Like a vulcanized 
um, Dr. Martin's 1940, no, 1490 or whatever I've got. It kind of looks so similar like that. And it's got really, really thin laces on it. I kind of like the look of it. I'm not going to lie. Um, the sole is really interesting. It kind of reminds you of the Luna Nikes from back in the day. It's all kind of like one bulbous little unit. It's not as thick as I'd probably want it. That's the only thing. I think Martin Rose has a thing about not having overly thick soles. Um, I kind of like my soles to be a bit thicker, but these look really interesting. So I guess we've got three models here so far. We've got these high heels for women. And then we've got, with really, actually the heels look really comfortable. They've got a really, really thick heel down the back of the, um, they've got a really thick heel, sorry. So it can kind of, you know, help in terms of comfortability from what I've heard from the ladies. The thinner the heel, the harder they are to walk. So when that surface area is a bit wider, it kind of makes them way more comfier to wear. Even if the heel is really high, it can still be super comfy, even more comfy to wearing a pair of trainers. So it looks pretty cool. And then of course, as I said before, you've got what looks like an Oxford shoe. Um, and it kind of looks like it's all done in kind of been enveloped in cool kind of one piece in a weird way. Um, maybe the top is made out of another material than the, than the midsole, but it kind of looks like they're all the same thing. And you've got the same approach here on the black pair also. And really, like I said, really thin laces. They kind of remind me of the laces that you see in Salomon shoes and shit. Very, very thin laces. So I'm curious to see what the vibe is and what they look like overall in person, but they look pretty cool to start off with. So I'm really happy about that. But going back to the flipping martin rose show actually spring 2024 the first thing i wanted to mention regarding this is just a setting it reminded me a lot of the of the first kind of veteran runway show that they did in 2015 when demler used to design for it and if i remember correctly it was at some club it was at a nightclub and the music was super loud in there yeah there we go see um at the basement of a famous gay club called le deep le depo le depo and i remember it being really dark and stuff and it was a great kind of I felt introduction to the brand, Vetemar and the community of people behind it. Loads of the models that walked the show were involved in the quote unquote co-designing of the brand. When it first started, the whole idea behind it was that it was designed by a community, which I don't really believe. I feel like Demino was doing it from the beginning, but he kind of didn't want the limelight and probably was afraid. If people say it was shit, you could kind of hide behind. It's a collective sort of thing. But I do remember some of the models, you know, I used to see them out and about in East London and shit. So I was kind of cool to see them featured on the runway at Vetemar. So you kind of see, you know, what the vibe was there. But the, this show from Martin Rose reminded me a lot of it because this Martin Rose show, if I'm not mistaken, took place in a community club centre thing that we have here in the UK. We don't really have many of them. They've all kind of, I feel like, I don't know, they've all kind of disappeared in the same way like youth clubs don't exist anymore. But the last one that I can remember that kind of had a similar sort of feel was this place called Efez in Dawson, which was essentially like a snooker club, but also had a kind of community vibe type of feel. And there was another place as well, more specifically around West Ham area. That was a community club where essentially sometimes after Sunday league games, we'd go there to have drinks or to have meals, or it'd be a place where you'd have like your end of season presentation. You'd get awards and medals and shit. It was kind of, you know, the local kind of, you know, club clubhouse sort of vibe. So the local cricket club would go there and do their thing, rugby, all that stuff. So that kind of vibe kind of reminded me of so if anything it really centered this collection in the uk in london and whatever it may be and the clothes kind of resonate a lot with again the way that i've kind of grew up and the kind of things that i've kind of been into um the track pants the track suit jackets again i've loved the mix um between you know the silk tops and uh what you would describe maybe as more like you know cis masculine gendered kind of track suits the kind of fusion behind those type of things is really really cool the friction sorry between those two things i really really like um the shoes actually that i thought were women's actually might be unisex because this model here may be wearing the same shoe i'm not too sure if that's the same one it kind of looks like it but i don't think it is i don't think so. i think it might be a bit different actually than this heel that i've got featured here I think it's slightly different actually. It's a bit more of a wider, um, you know, wider tip here on the sole, on the toe, sorry, which is kind of a signature Martin Rose thing that she does with her loafers. You get these kind of really nice African uncle cut that's kind of really rectangle. Um, and obviously something that Balenciaga do, but I'm sure she's done a lot of work with Demna um, in the past and Vettel Mars, that's why you get a lot of kind of overlap, especially with some of the outerwear. I feel like some of her mountain jackets and stuff, they kind of give me a lot of Vettel Mars, Demna sort of vibe. But yeah, the friction between these two things is really cool. You got these really amazing leather pants and look five and this great little blouse, flowery thing with the pearls. Like this to me looks like a look that I would be in every day, mate. This is a fantastic, like, it's probably the best 
version of like a perfect Bergheim panorama by outfit. You could easily take off the top and be dancing in the main floor of Bergheim and be great. Put on the shirt, go up as a pano and be twirling your hands and be feeling absolutely fantastic also. So I love that. This model here is really interesting, look number six, because I feel like this looks like Martin Rose. I'm not sure if it's done on purpose or not, but she basically looks like Martin Rose um, with the lipstick and the frizzy and the frizzy hair with the grey with the greys here and there. I really like the look of it. Um the trousers that kind of look like they've been, you know, they kind of skewed a little bit in terms of proportions and stuff. They look really cool, but that model so look I'm out in rose. You've got a really nice suiting here that looks that reminds me a lot of like the ceilings you'd have in houses or the curtains in some council houses around the UK. Sometimes you have this kind of wallpaper effect where you have this kind of weird suede um, relief type pattern on top of it. I'm sure some of you guys remember that sort of thing. That kind of reminds me of that. The really long pearl necklaces are really cute as well. I like the look of those. Again, I'm not really too fan of that one. Nice leather look there with the pantyhose. Again, the friction with this kind of, what would you call it? Um... I guess you'd call it some sort I guess you call it a blouse, right? This kind of blouse that looks like it's made made out of silk or satin and a nice, you know, loose fluorescent shirt on top and some jeans and some boots. Like that is ridiculously good, that look number ten. I love everything about look number ten. Um again, look number twelve again is very is very much giving Martin Rose type of vibes with a big lipstick and the curly hair. That shirt is absolutely amazing. There's a great piece of jewelry there. This metal type of bar box here on top looks really great. The leather pants fit great. Good little loafers there with the contrast stitching again. Very much giving ankle vibes. This reminds me a lot of the character um, from flipping the wire the guy with the guns that whistles and shit with a long jacket that kind of reminds me of that sort of vibe or maybe um the denzel washington's movie as it son of sam or I forgot what it's called where he kind of walks around with glasses and a gun and shit kind of reminds me of that sort of vibe this long olive coat that goes maybe floor length great pair of trousers again is that silk is that set i'm not too sure the heart on the belt the pearls like it's fucking beautiful man like martin rhodes is definitely one of our better designers here in london for sure she's absolutely amazing man another great look here again not too sure the material the materials on on some of these looks look really interesting i'd love to see what they look like in hand because some of it looks like it might be patent some of it looks like it might be leather it could be pvc i'm not really too sure what the mix is i love this look also with this big fluffy bag on look number 16 that looks great look number 17 the same thing that kind of olive green kind of flavor i'm not too sure what this this kind of looks like a coat hanger i'm not too sure what this bar is that's going around the top over the head like a necklace or whatever but that looks really interesting uh, we've got a great little bum bag accessory there from martin rose that's probably going to be very popular with some of the club kids out there great pair of pearl necklaces again with the big red lipstick I can't wear that probably because I said Rocky doesn't like people. My skin color wearing contrasting um, or bright colors flipping lipstick. Uh, again, with a great look with the long coat and the pearls. That's fucking brilliant with a big pair of jeans. But my favorite look of all is definitely look number 20. Um, look, the guy's giving that that bomber jacket a good look because that bomber jacket is absolutely banging. It's absolutely covered. If we zoom in here, actually, we can see it better. It's absolutely covered in these cool little badges and pins all over the place. I'm sure this is probably going to be made in very small quantity, I'd imagine. Like, it's absolutely crazy. It looks like it's probably all done by hand, I'd imagine. It's got some safety pins. It's got bottle cap openers. It's got badges. It's got actual, actual bottles from beer bottles that's been stuck on there. It looks flipping crazy good with a pair of flipping shorts. And um, what what are the shoes? Oh, wow. Is that a pair of Air Maxes? I'm not sure. No. They look like Essex to me, right? Are they Essex? Yeah, they may be Essex. They may be what we saw here in the background of this shoe. So it might be that shoe there at the back. Maybe that's a model, I'm not really too sure, but they kind of look like Essex to me. Whatever that shoe is there, I'm not really too sure what it is, but that's a, probably a collab that's probably soon to come out. And I'm also not mad at these almost, um, you know, sheer, I guess, pantyhose type socks things. I remember Random Identities had the similar sort of vibe of these kind of like athletic sock length, Athlet, yeah, socks that are like athletic length but they kind of got a bit of a pantyhose vibe about them i kind of don't mind these in the slightest they look really really cool um anyway we continue let's take that out there let's go on the next look 
Uh, I like the look of these also. Oh, look at the flipping trousers on them. Look at they got leather patches on the knees. I kind of like that little detail. You've got a t-shirt here that says blow your mind, I guess, there with Martin Rose graphic. And again, the pearls. I feel like pearls are a little bit overdone. But with this look that they're featured in, they look great. Oh, that's my favorite. This belt is great. They've taken the Rizla logo that's synonymous with people here in London who fucking love to smoke fucking rollies. And they've kind of flipped it with Rose on it with a plus sign. That looks really great. That might be the hint of a diffusion line. Maybe it's Martin Rose and Rose Plus. I'm not too sure, but that belt looks great. I love that belt. That's a really good idea. Very, very clever use um, of a logo flip there. Um, for Martin Rose, this look here with the big fur jacket is really beautiful too. These jeans are going to be extremely popular. The same way how the jeans that I think for Martin Rose that I forgot who else was wearing them for a while in fashion. Maybe it was Kanye. I'm not too sure, but these jeans are going to be very popular with the um with the with I don't know buckles towards the end. They look like you can cinch the trousers a little bit or make them a little bit wider if need be. These are going to be very, 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 very popular. I definitely imagine that to be the case. And again, more little pearls here with the models. The casting's fucking awesome. I love I love casting like this. I don't always want to see fucking twink 19 year olds wearing clothes and looking fantastic i want to see semi quote-unquote real people um and a broad spectrum of ages and interests and stuff going forward so i love that another great look there some interesting shoe choices also here cool another great look here look 24 i'm always a big fan of big fluorescent safety type jackets again you know this is kind of my vibe anyway in terms of the stuff that i wear i'm always going to fucking you know army surplus stores and getting jackets and shit to wear so that sort of stuff is definitely vibing with me you got the same trousers again in like looks like a faux leather effect pant style with the buckles at the bottom also i think they're gonna be very popular as well oops move that there let's continue nice look there 25 great look there on 26 27 we love this we love that oh these pants also i think i made the point to say before that i had in my mind for a while um an opportunity oh no, i had in my mind an idea to start making like pants that i went to wear that particular shape and whatnot and my inspiration was like the pants that you know local builders and handy men and flipping bin men wear they're kind of fluorescent and usually they have different kind of color blockings all over them and i went to make them a particular style with that sort of style so it's a particular fit but have a particular kind of color blocking so it maybe didn't look like you're a bin man, but it kind of had the same sort of pattern and then i saw the flipping martin rose collection i was like damn it if i end up making them now because people have got recency bias they're gonna think immediately that i'm kind of copying martin rose when actually i'm trying to copy flipping local council bin men and shit which is definitely a sign for me to just do the idea, execute it, put it out there, and wherever it happens, happens. But kind of holding on to stuff and procrastinating really is the enemy of fucking progress, essentially, when it comes to ideation. So I'm really disappointed I didn't ship those, but I'm definitely going to do them anyway in the future, regardless, especially if I want to wear them. This whole entire leather look is great. Um, this is one of my favorite looks, actually. This entire, actually, one of my favorite items in this collection is this red jacket. It's essentially like a really interesting mix between a vintage mountain jacket like a north face or a you know whatever else and then it's also a good mix between like a barber and an m65 it's got that sort of vibe um in terms of the pocket placement the belt the shape it's a really interesting it's like a fusion essentially they're taking the sleeves of a mountain jacket and attached it to a barber but then obviously updated the colors because you're never going to get a barber in this mat in this nice red you know um sort of finish it looks really really great to be fair i love it that looks fucking beautiful. I'm a big fan of that jacket. Um, and then again, this hoodie is going to be really popular too. I'd imagine with a lot of the kids. Martin Rose Sports written there really well. Um, these pants are amazing. These loungy striped pants look really great. That fluffy bag is awesome. I guess it's the same coat as well. That long length coat, but maybe it's a bit shorter there. It comes just underneath the bum. And then we've got a couple more looks here. Another great look. This, yeah, this is a quintessential look that I would kind of wear as well. Like, this is an incredible look. You've got this amazing, it kind of looks like, um, it kind of looks like a corset, the top, a little bit, but it's not. It's kind of got a similar sort of vibe to it. And then it's got the pair of construction, you know, everyday type of pants, whatever it may be called, that sort of pattern. And then you've got this amazing fur coat on top. So it's a great mix between like being incredibly, incredibly chic and also very 
uh, practical day to day in terms of wearing. I love the flipping mix on them. This actually is a good platform of styling. If you wanted to do this, you could easily copy this look yourself with your own little bits and bobs. So I love the look of that actually. Um, actually, it might be something that I actually might do actually for a night out. Maybe change the top and just buy a pair of these pants from like a local, you know, um, hardware store, whatever it may be, and a vintage fur somewhere from maybe, you know, flipping beyond retro or whatnot, and then kind of just floss back on the fucking streets of Dawson for one more night, just to kind of remind people of my fucking power. That might have to be the vibe. And again, a nice real jacket here, look number, what's that, 37? Yeah, look number 34, actually. This orange jacket, this orange parka is beautiful too. Again, I love that most of these things are probably inspired by like vintage items that she kind of maybe redesigns or edits and stuff, or maybe it's come straight from her mind, I'm not too sure, but Martin Rose has a real talent for designing great, um, you know, vintage, retro-inspired fucking outerwear pieces that I'm all over. This is the kind of stuff that you would maybe find in a flea market, in a kilo sale somewhere in Berlin or Prague or fucking Krakow. I love the look of this. And it's even got a pair of matching pants also, so that looks flipping great. And then we continue here, 35, and then a nice jumper look there, 37, 38, and then 39 here to end as well with these jorts that are going to be everywhere. They look like jorts, so they could be a scum for sure, but they look like a jort length I'm not too sure about. But again, these socks I'm not mad at. I'm not mad at these socks. These socks are really, really interesting. Again, the sheer kind of, you know, application there and this nice little... Uh, pile fur type number in terms of the jacket so martin rose absolutely smashed it i love everything about it there's a short clip as well from the collection i'm going to play here video that kind of features some of the vibes so you can see what the kind of vibe was in terms of the show itself let's play the little clip here courtesy of fashion report <laughs> It legit reminds me of that first collection for Vetemar because I swear to God, I remember the video of it was in a club and the the, peop, the, the the models were walking right by the people that were sitting down and it was super loud. It was really in a tight little space. I love how they did it. It's really, really cool. I love it. But it also reminds me of like being in these kind of community club center type things. Well, the first thing you remember is like, you know, it always smells like shit. It always smells like cigarettes, beer on the carpet or fucking vomit somewhere along those lines. But they felt really, really homely as well in a weird way. so much attitude i fucking love martin rose so fucking good so underrated like i said i'm so happy that it didn't work out the louis vuitton thing selfishly i'm sure maybe she probably would have liked to have done something like that it's probably the you know it's a great probably compliment to your work to get recognized by those big luxury houses but selfishly as a fan of fashion and a fan of the brand i'm happy that all her creative juices and inspiration is going to be funneled for a flipping martin rose and we're going to get unapologetic um, representation of what she's about and what she's into courtesy of her and the team and so i'm really really happy about it i'm not gonna lie And as great the pictures look, these clothes always look better in motion. They always look much better in motion, most of these pieces. They look great, obviously, in the 2D image, but once you see them in motion, people wearing them like that, and that bomber jacket, the yellow one with all the flipping bottle caps and stuff all over it, is an absolute winner of a piece. I definitely see someone like an ASAP Bari wearing that jacket sometime soon. <laughs>
up Martin Rose. Absolutely incredible. Loved it. Every bit of it. Martin Rose Spring 2024 menswear available to check out on Vogue Runway. Check it out. Vogue.com. And you'll be able to check it out and see that. It's absolutely banging. Love every single bit of it. And then, of course, the other bit as well um, as an introduction or another kind of reminder of what they've done with Nike. They've got these flipping shock mule things that are probably due to come out very soon. Not really the biggest fan of them, but something also entitled me thinks you know what i kind of like the challenge of trying to make these work because i have a feeling these type of shoes it's essentially like a a sock uh, sorry a nike shock that's been you know elongated a little bit um they kind of feel like a shoe that would only work for somebody that's underneath you know that's under a size nine or something uk but i, f I would accept the challenge of trying to make these work as a size what 11 or something uk actually that would be a really good challenge to see can you actually freak these and make these work with a fucking gigantic uk 10 to uk 11 flipping foot that would be an absolute challenge to do and i'd gladly accept them as a flipping shooter freak because there's something very unique about these shoes that would definitely stand out from the dredges of fucking new balances and you know nonsense shoes that everybody's wearing day to day these actually are a little bit more you know a little bit more risque um but will definitely get you challenging yourself and kind of maybe thinking of different ideas in terms of looks that you can put together to make these work um this is courtesy of sneaker new just says martin rose prepares new nike shocks r4 colorways for spring summer 24 the beloved likes of Kendrick Lamar, who gave a shout out to the designer in his verse for Hillbillies. Just finished the latest show, London's Fashion Week, alongside Playful Tailoring, as well as a Nike Shock Retro. The following the success initial release, the Martin Rose Shock R4 will be releasing in not just one or two, but what looks like to be three new colorways cited for spring 2024 arrival. Um, he enjoyed a closer look at them. So you've got a pair that looks like they're a bit more black, purpley and blue. You've got a really nice yellow sunset colorway and then a nice kind of sky blue um to purple type of vibe as well going on there and also the, i think there's a black pair in the background there also it might be this no it actually might be this the toe of that actually I'm, I'm confused but they look really cool i love the look of them i don't actually recognize seeing them on the runway maybe my eyes are not really the greatest if you go back on the runway i don't really end up i didn't see anybody on the runway wearing a pair but they're available there on the you see on the table they've got a pair of the loafers also that a couple of the models were wearing i think if you scroll down here you see the the stitch of the loafers there but i don't actually recognize or see any of those flipping shoes maybe it's this actually maybe it's that yeah there we go i think there's a pair there maybe that kid here is wearing a pair but it looks like it looks a bit different it looks like it's got a tip in the front there i'm not really sure if that's the same shoe I don't know if it is. Maybe it is. Who knows? But either way, looks really great. Um, I love the colorways. Again, like I said, it's a bit of a challenging shoe to wear, but definitely something that I will be prepared to kind of try out and see what the vibe is. I think the retail was kind of expensive. I remember when I first saw the when the first colorways dropped that were kind of a classic or a Nike shot, shot colorway in the black and the reds. So I'm interested to see what the other what they priced at. But if I'm not mistaken, they were quite pricey. Let me see if I can find them here. Um, Martin Rose Nike Shock. Yeah, let's see. There's a black and something colorway. That was the one, that black one there. Uh, so, okay, they're available and still in black in Nike.com. That's crazy if they're still available to purchase. I would have thought they would have sold out a long time ago. Okay, cool. It's just like a, it's like a holding page. It's not actually available to purchase, it looks like, courtesy of the store. But you got them available there for £179.95. pence. Basically, 180 They're a bit pricey, innit? A bit pricey, mate. I'm not going to lie. They're fucking a bit pricey. It's a bit mad. To purchase these for that fucking price they're available sold out yeah as you can see they're sold out no need to wait for the pictures um and what are they going for in terms of stockx how much are they going for i'd imagine probably a lot right okay 225 pounds to 367 pretty pricey for them but i did quite like the first colorways that they put out again a classic sort of shot colorway i'm just not a fan of the mule type of shape and i feel like with a shoe like this you probably want to wear them with a proper heel because you're gonna you know they're kind of high and shit and whatever but yeah they did really do a bit of damage on the streets out here of london i think most of the time if you see somebody wearing these out there in the streets you definitely know they've got a passion for fashion it's just a given really <laughs> if you see the same thing if you see them wearing like martin rose technos right the ones with the lumps and bumps all over them they've definitely got a passion for fashion it's basically impossible that they just purchased them because they like the look at them they're definitely you know they definitely collect magazines like i do and go to fashion shows and obsess over fucking collections and whatnot and buy archive shit definitely that type of person so i love the look of it look at everything they're doing and i'm eager to see some more eager to see some more anyways that has been 
The Excellence Ding Show, episode number 683, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's 683. If it's not 683, I apologize, but I'm pretty sure it is. Thank you for tuning in. If it's your first time, I do appreciate you. Um, and of course, if you've enjoyed the show, you know what to do. Click the links in my description for more information regarding me. You can follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. There's also a Patreon link there because I've got a new Patreon episode I just dropped for my full review of the Idol episode one and two. You can join my Patreon for as little as $1 per month. So if you want to check out my review on there, definitely join the Patreon. But apart from that, hope you've enjoyed. And if you're listening to the audio part of the show, you will hear my tune of the day. So if you're watching the show, you'll just hear here it go to grey but of course if you want to listen to a tune of the day why not jump over to the audio side of the platform to see that as well but thanks everyone for tuning in been a pleasure to have your company and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace